welcome to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Seminar Series. Um, we have the full list of speakers for the rest of the quarter, which includes two non-Monday speakers up on our website at bec.ucla.edu. And next Monday is a holiday, so we won't have a Beck talk. Um, but we do have a talk uh, a week from this Friday, so not the Monday of the holiday, but the Friday of that week. Adam McClowski is coming, um, and his talk is, he's, oh gosh, I don't know if I can pronounce this university name, Et Etvos, University Department of Ethology, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and his talk is entitled Dog-Human Social Interaction, Old Wine in New Bottles. So be sure to join us for that. It's on Friday at noon um, in this room, a week from this Friday. And this week, I'm happy to introduce Brian Wood, who comes to us from the Stanford Department of Anthropology, where he's a postdoc. Mm -hmm. And his talk is uh, Household and Kin Provisioning by Hods and Males. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Brooke, for inviting me and to the organizers of this uh, Beck series for having me come down from Palo Alto. I really appreciate having a moment of your time today. So um, today being Valentine's Day, I think um, it's an appropriate holiday to discuss some of the research I've been doing, which one of the things I'll be talking about today is food sharing between husbands and wives and its relationship to reproduction. So I couldn't think of a better holiday to be talking about this subject. Um, so since 2004, I've had the privilege of spending time living with Hadza of northern Tanzania, who are one of the few remaining societies in which some of the people continue to live largely through hunting and gathering. Most of my research, which I'll be presenting today, is from my dissertation, which focuses on processes of social group formation, food production, and food sharing. I study these things because I'm interested in learning how the Hadza, with relatively simple technology and expert knowledge of their environment and myriad forms of cooperation, are able today to continue to survive and thrive in their savanna environment. So the reasons that I'm focusing on these questions is I think they're quite basic to getting a better understanding about how, how the Hadza make a living. Um, it's also interesting that some of the problems that the Hadza face on a daily basis might not be too different from those which have been faced by hunter-gatherers living in East Africa for many millennia. So studying the Hadza is also a means to test ideas about behavioral processes that may have been very important in human evolution and to stimulate new thinking on these ideas. So not that many of you might need it, but I thought I would give you a brief introduction to the Hadza and describe who they are and where they're living. So the Hadza live in small camps. Um, that average between 25 and 45 individuals. The number fluctuates daily as people come and go, visiting being a very common occurrence in Hadza camps. Within residential groups, the work of finding food is a big part of everyday life. Men and women discuss possible places where they could go foraging. They talk about times where food was more plenty than it is today. They complain about missed opportunities, especially men. Uh, talking about uh, the missed chances they had when they were out hunting. So the act of finding food is a big part of people's life, and it's also something that anthropologists have paid quite a bit of attention to in studies of the Hadza. So depending upon the foods that they pursue, men and women might forage alone or in groups. Men typically forage solitarily or in pairs, and when they're out foraging, they'll be going for large game, small game, wild honey, depending on the season and what's available, they'll also be acquiring baobab fruit and berries. Women typically forage in groups, accompanied quite often by a male escort, and the, the staple food that women are able to pursue year in, year out, regardless of the season, is are, are various forms of underground storage organs, different species of tubers. They also are very active and will cooperatively forage with men in times when they're pursuing uh, wild honey. So sometimes husbands and wives will go together on a foray to get honey, and oftentimes they'll at the same time be getting baobab fruit together. But women will also um, pick up baobab fruit while they're out foraging, and they're very actively involved in the acquisition of berries when they're in season. That's a, that's a, a big activity that big groups will form when the berries are ripe 
um, and people will be uh, feasting on the berries for as long as they can. So that's a background to some of the foods that they acquire. Um, and when they go out foraging, men uh, will be feeding themselves as they're hunting or as they're going for wild honey. And then the surplus that they acquire, they'll bring back to camp and they'll share it with others. Women as well, when they're out foraging, will oftentimes take breaks, cook up some tubers, let's say, or be eating berries while they're foraging, and then take a very large load of these foods back to camp and share it with others. All this cooperative foraging and food sharing is quite typical of hunter-gatherers. So when two Hadza adults marry, with monogamy, monogamy being the norm, they signify this relationship by sleeping together in the same house. However, during most of the day, men are out foraging in one location, women are in a different location, going for different foods. And when they come back to camp, men and women oftentimes sit apart from each other. So the men, this picture is quite dark, but the men often sit in an area, um, the Gibalejako Sheme Pitina, which is an area where men will be sitting and repairing tools, discussing what they did that day, while women sit in an area usually with adult women, younger women, and children, uh, the Gibali Jaco Aquiti Betina. So you can see this spatial division of the sexes. And here are GPS tracks that we've taken recently, which record the movement of a husband and wife couple over 10 days of observation. And so you can see in red here, this is, this is a husband, and you can see where he's gone foraging, and this area, this area being the residential camp that we were doing our research in. So you can see this is the area that men typically spend their time in, and the blue being his wife, you can see her foraging tracks as well as the area where she spends time in camp with other women. So you can see there's this there's this difference in space use. Now this area here where the lines overlap, that's their home. So I think these contrasting spatial arrangements, which both bring men and women together in very intimate ways, but also keep them separate, I think embodies a active theme of research among the Hadza, which is the cooperation or lack thereof between sexes in the support of a family. And that's an issue that I've been taking up with my own research as well. So when I set out to do my dissertation, much had already been learned and written about the Hadza in regards to how they forage and how food sharing occurs. And this is due to the careful work of several generations of anthropologists that came before me. And I'm delighted to see that Nicholas Burton Jones um, is, is, is in attendance today who who knows more about anything I'm talking about today than I do. So direct your questions <laughs> at him when I have a puzzled look on my face, please. But uh, Nick, Nicholas is, is my intellectual grandfather. Uh, he, he was the advisor to Frank Marlowe, who was my thesis advisor. And he's played a very prominent role in uh, the behavioral ecology research that's taken place with the Hadza. This picture is actually a photograph that we found in our research shed that was perhaps taken by Nick. I know that's his vehicle right there. And uh, you know, we bring these pictures out with us when we, when we work with the Hadza. And they, they're sure to you know, point out their friends um, and, uh, and wonder who people might be. And this, this individual here named Piwa was a big part of my dissertation. And the photograph that we found of him as a younger man, he, uh, he's holding up right there. So we've uh, been working with the Hadza for uh, for quite some time, since uh, the early 70s at least. And so um, we have a, a very good longitudinal data set with, with some of our uh, research problems that we're working on. So while much was already known about the Hadza and the way that they acquire foods and they share them, there was even more that was unknown. And some of what was unknown was critical to understanding basic elements of Hadza society. The issues I will be focusing on here today is the relationship between male food production and reproductive success. So in at least six foraging and horticultural groups, including the Hadza, 
it has been found that there's a positive relationship between men's success in terms of foraging and their reproductive success. So while this relationship between these two ver traits is, is quite interesting, the underlying processes, the intermediate mechanisms that create this relationship are, are not well known. So this path diagram gives you an example of some of the processes at work that might create this relationship. Um, it's not meant to be co a complete schematic diagram or applicable to all groups, but it is useful for the research of the Hadza that I'll be describing next. So men's uh, foraging success has been measured in terms of their reputation as a hunter. And my advisor, Frank Marlowe, had found that men with better hunting reputations have both more children born and more surviving offspring, controlling for age. Um, so this is the relationship that's been found in several other groups. And the research I'll be describing next gets into some of the intermediate processes that are at work underlying this association. So Kristen Hawks and colleagues completed a study of food sharing by looking at distributions of large game that Hadza males had acquired during their period of study in the mid 80s to the late 80s. And a very interesting relationship that she found was that contrary to the expectations that men might be promoting their own family's interests when they go hunting or foraging by acquiring foods that they can share with their households, uh, what she actually found is that the share that acquirers were keeping of large game was in most instances no larger than what other households in camp were receiving. You can see these, these two box plots here are well within the same distribution and there's no difference. So this relationship between the size of the food that share that hunters themselves were keeping for their households and what they were giving to others uh, basically caused, caused her to recognize that the relationship between men's food production and the welfare of their wives or the welfare of their children it might not be as straightforward as, as you would otherwise think. So this gave her reason to question the idea that men's food production has a direct positive uh, benefit on their families. She also explored the relationship between men's foraging success and the quality in terms of weight gain of their spouses and of their children. So she measured during their periods of field work how much weight children and how much weight spouses put on. And these are correlations of the father's overall hunting success rate in terms of large prey per day and children's seasonal weight change. So what she found is that there was a strong positive correlation between men's foraging success and their children's weight gain. She also studied a similar relationship between husbands' overall hunting success in terms of large prey per day and the, the weight that their wives put on during the period of observation. Since weight gain and weight loss is a very good general indicator of health, these uh, data points show that there is a relationship, again, between men's hunting success and positive health outcomes of their spouse and of their child children, but knowing that men's foods are shared very widely, it again gives you good reason to question whether or not it's the actual food production and the sharing of the men that is producing uh, these relationships. She made another very astute observation, which is that husband's overall hunting success rate, again in terms of large prey per day, is also associated with a measure of their wives' food production. So what she found is looking at wives' average seasonal foraging time, this is the amount of time that the wives of hunters were putting into foraging, she found a positive relationship between men's foraging success and their wives' foraging success, or foraging behavior as it may be. So putting all these parts together, she reasoned that what was actually driving the association between men's foraging success and the condition of their spouses and the condition of their children was actually this process is an assortative mating idea that successful male foragers are married to successful female foragers and it's the 
food acquisition and provisioning by mothers, which is creating these associations. So after this research was done, um, you know, this has enlightened our understanding of the relationships, the possible relationships that can exist between men's food production and the condition of their families, and it stimulated further research. So now I'm going to describe some work that my advisor Frank has done. So working in the mid-90s, what Frank investigated was the relationship between the reproductive state of women and the behavior of their husbands in terms of foraging. So these are two uh, illustrative uh, charts which basically demonstrate uh, Frank's argument with regard to men's behavior and its effect on uh, the household and its economic condition. So what he did is he looked at the age of the youngest child within a household and plotted against this mother's return rate in terms of the amount of food that they're bringing back to camp per day. And what he found is that there was a strong positive relationship. So women who had very young children, under age one in particular, had low foraging return rates. And this is understandable given the demands of childcare for a small infant. Um, Hadza women are very active and are able to go foraging soon after a birth. But nevertheless, there does seem to be a relationship in which after a child has, you know, is, is starting to approach weaning age and is a little bit more independent, women are able to be acquiring more of the food than they would otherwise. This is all cross-sectional data, by the way. And another interesting uh, bit of evidence that Frank found was that if you simply tabulate men according to whether they have a child in their house that's less than one year old or older than one year old, you find a stark difference in the relative food production of husbands and wives. So those men that do not have a young child in their household are producing basically an equal amount of food as their wives. The y-axis here is taking the wives food production and subtracting the male food production. So a negative value on this chart indicates that men are producing more foods in relationship to their wives. And so what he found is that men who do have a child in this area here, less than one year old, are producing over 2,000 calories per day more food than their wives are. So based upon these data, Frank has argued that especially during the time in which children are quite young, men's food production is actually a significant part of how the nuclear family is able to, uh, to, 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 to thrive, is that this, this is a, a, a particularly critical period in which men's food production plays an important role. So after these studies have, have been finished, we have different ideas floating around about the possible ways that men's food production can be related to their fitness. And while we have some very illustrative data and some exciting ideas, we still lack some basic information about how foods are produced and how they're shared among the Hadza. And this is why I wanted to focus on this for my dissertation, is that I thought that there was some basic information that had yet to be explored. One of the things that had not been addressed was getting a, a larger sample of men's food sharing that did not just focus on one class of resources, such as large game, but the spectrum of resources which, which men are acquiring. So after these studies, all we knew about men's uh, food sharing was based on the sample of large game that I showed you earlier. So we had no idea about actually how foods were being shared between husbands and wives, because no study had been done on this. We also had no idea about husbands' direct provisioning of offspring, because the study that I showed you of Frank's is all based upon the amount of food men were bringing back to camp. It didn't have uh, the analysis or the observation of food sharing. So we couldn't actually say how much of that food was ending up in a household. Another thing was just analyzing the, these relationships between uh, husbands' provisioning of their offspring and their wives' nutritional status. So these, these are where food sharing data become critical. And I wanted to investigate these questions to get a fuller idea about men's food sharing. Um, we also had no idea about possible kin biases in food sharing. Um, we know that the Hadza live in residential groups with 
several close kin, typically, but we didn't know anything about how foods were, you know, preferentially shared with kin or not. So that was another question that I wanted to investigate. And none of the work that we had done so far had tabulated food consumption among different individuals from food sharing. So these were some of the basic questions that I wanted to focus on in my dissertation. So this is a overview of the area where I've been working. Um, I'm sorry the graph is, or the, the, the map is quite dark, but um, so this is northern Tanzania. Here's, here's Lake Iyasi, and there's a, there's a probably faint, too faint to see, red line defining a general area within which the Hadza continue to forage. Um, and these, in this map, every one of these black dots is a camp that I've worked in. Um, there's nine dots on here. Um, these are the camps that I've been in since 2004, but for my dissertation, I only uh, focused on the food production and food sharing in seven of these camps. Um, you can see that there's a, a, cluster of, a cluster of camps that I've worked on in this area here. This is also the same area that prior Hadza research has generally focused upon with these questions. Um, the Hadza recon recognize several sort of sub-regions within the area that they live in. So, and, and it's typically the people who come from those regions are, are named after the place. So this is uh, referred to as Tliika, and the people here, Tliikanabe. Um, up here, more near Mangola, there is a camp that I worked in, which was inside the Ngorongoro Conservation Area. These people would be referred to as Mangolanabe. Um, over here to the west of Lake Iyasi, which is a place that has not been uh, studied very much in the course of Hadza research, this area is called Dunduina, so the people are Dunduina Bay, and that was a camp that I worked in in 2005. And then over here, somewhat in between the Mangola area and Tliika, is an area called Hanga, and this is an area where the people would be referred to as Hangapi. So there's um, a, a, a spread of camps that I've been working on um, in my research. So what I did was I conducted my study in seven different Hadza camps between 2005 and 2009. And this includes 249 days of observation in which we were collecting as part of a large human behavioral ecology project under the direction of, of Frank. Uh, we were collecting food return data, weighing all the foods that men and women were bringing in. And as well, I was conducting focal food observations. So if I was free in a moment of data collection, um, and an individual came into camp uh, bearing foods, I would follow the food and try my darndest to get a full overview of how it was being shared. So that was, that's what I refer to as a focal food observation. The typical data collection procedure that I used was I did household, randomized household follows, where I would spend blocks of time in a given household or a group of households if they were close enough to be observed simultaneously. Um, and if I was at one of these house, household observations and an individual came in with foods, I would break away from analyzing the household if there was no food sharing going on and I would try to follow the foods. And other research that we've done, you know, has, has analyzed, of course, issues of uh, child care and assistance and other forms of cooperation and we have follow data that describes uh, focal individual follow data where we follow women while they're foraging and observe what they're doing. We have the same data sets for, for men as well, but I'm not going to be presenting any of that data right now. And when I was observing food sharing within the camp, my procedures of data collection would vary depending on what types of food it was that I was observing. So with large game, in which it's a very public affair when foods are brought in, such as large game, because, you know, the word will spread within camp that somebody has killed an animal. A party of people will usually go off to the kill site if it's a significantly large animal. If it's something a little bit smaller, maybe one person or two people will come back to camp with, with the, the carcass. And then food sharing commences. It usually begins at the kill site if a party of people have traveled to the kill site. But if a large animal is brought back to camp relatively whole, there'll be a butchery uh, that occurs within camp, and people will carry off from the butchery site household shares that they'll bring to their house, and typically they'll take a, this share that they've claimed for their household and they'll put it on a 
on a rock or hang it in a tree or on the frame of their house. And I would observe all of this and wait until I felt like there had been a, a calm and that the food sharing within camp for such a large animal had stopped. And then after people were settled down, I would go around to the houses and, and weigh each household share. So that's how I did this with, with large game. With other classes of resources, it really depended how I would be able to catch these data. So um, in the case of sharing honey, it was a completely different procedure. Men would typically come in with a, with a container with uh, honey inside of it. And as soon as they got into camp, people would want to, to know, do you have any honey? You know, and if you do, can I have some? You know, it's like an immediate uh, request. And oftentimes men will say, no, I don't have any. But you can tell they're lying usually, um, <laughs> and uh, just by the heft of the thing. So a typical situation, and these things vary, of course, but a typical situation with honey would be, you know, people would be there, would see the man coming in with honey and stand around him, you know, indicating they'd love to have a share. And the man who was bearing the honey would make a division, give some away and put it in a cup and hand it over to another group of people or make two separate little divisions given to different people and then bring back what remained to his household. And what I found is that if their wives were present at the time, they would often just hand it directly to their wife. If their wives were out foraging or weren't around, what men would do usually is hang it on, their, on the frame of their house as well. So in the case of honey, I would, I would code that initial distribution by the acquirer himself as the primary distribution. Um, and in the case of other animals, small game, again, the, the sharing that I call a primary distribution is typically the sharing of the raw shares before anything gets cooked. Um, so I would typically, in the case of large game, be able to surely get the primary distribution. Being able to observe all the eating that subsequently happens to a primary distribution is basically impossible because there's so many people simultaneously at their houses eating foods, you can't possibly observe it all. So I don't have any data that describes the entire consumption of a large animal. However, in the case of small game, in the case of fruit, in the case of honey, I was able to capture complete distributions. And so in these cases, what I would do is observe what was happening, be writing down with a, with a path diagram who's giving to whom and who's eating relative uh, amounts from each other. So, so within all of these food sharing data, I've uh, collected what I call primary distributions and complete distributions. Complete distributions are those in which I observed all the eating. Primary distributions are just the initial stage of food sharing. So that's background to the sharing data. But first what I'd like to do here is show you some of our tabulations of men's food production over the course of my study. So on the left, this pie chart represents of all the foods men were bringing back, in term, tabulated in terms of the number of instances in which they came back to camp bearing these foods. So you can see here on the left, honey was, of all the foods men brought in, 51% of the time it was honey that they were bringing into camp. The second most frequently brought into camp food is small game, which I classify as anything smaller than an impala, which at average is 38 kilograms. So the second most frequently brought in food is small game, followed by baobab, other resources which include berries and uh, typically, typically just berries, um, and large game, which is acquired, which is 5% of men's ac uh, food acquisitions. So while it's very rare for men to bring in large game, of course, given how large these animals are, it makes up a large proportion of the overall caloric pr food production that, that we've measured men to have. So on the right is a pie chart looking at overall calories produced by males and the percentage of different resource classes. And you can see here, now large game is the, is the uh, most important resource acquired by men followed by honey. You can track these data by the age of the acquirer, and that's what I've done here. So this is just to give you an overview of, of Hadza male food production. This is charting by age, by age class, um, 18 to 19, 20 to 24, generally five-year five year bins here of age. There are daily return rates of all foods uh, in these bar charts. And you can see you know, a, a, a plateau that's reached around age 25 and which continues. 
you know, more or less at the same at the same rate and decreases rapidly after about age 60 and uh, later periods. So this is considering all the foods that men are producing. And in here, just for illustrative sense, uh, sake, what I've done is I've posted those foods that are not large game. So you can get a sense, you know, the so these blue bars represent the median return rate per day of non-large game. So you can see that large game has a very strong role in determining what men's overall food acquisition rate is, and that the, you know, not surprisingly, the, the, the rate of acquiring non-large game foods is much lower than large game foods. Another thing that to consider in terms of uh, hods of food production is seasonality. What I've done is divided the data here very grossly into a wet season component and a dry season component. There's, there's sub-seasons, of course, that I could have done this in, but this gives the point that I'm trying to make here, which is that along here in the x-axis, we have the number of observation days, and we have two uh, colored line graphs here. The, the, the red one is men's two-day moving average of per capita food production of males. And the blue is per capita food production by females. And what you can see, of course, is in the dry season, that's the period in time in which large game hunting is most successful. And that's what each one of these spikes are, is a successful acquisition of a large animal. Whereas in the wet season, game are more dispersed, and it's not as easy to, to hunt large game. Um, and so men's large game hunting is much less successful during that period. And during, depending on the season and the camp, Men's and women's food production oscillates usually between a ratio of 40-60 male-female. It can go either way depending on what camp you're in and what time of year it is. So that gives you a background to male food production. Now I'm going to present some of my food sharing data. So in my sharing data set, like I said, I have divided this into primary distributions and complete distributions. And in these uh, classes, Large game, small game, honey, fruit, and a tuber. I have, I have one food distribution of a, of a tuber acquired by a man. And as you can see, like I mentioned earlier, there's no complete distributions for large game, given the difficulty of observing all consumption of an animal of, of that size. But in terms of small game and honey and fruit, I did manage to get some complete distributions, and that's the data that I'll principally be uh, presenting. So starting with large game, in our data set, what I've done here is I've plotted the portion of the overall uh, carcass weight that was kept by the acquirer, which is in black, and the portion which was kept by non-producer households on average for each of these uh, food distributions. This data is derived from 35 uh, distributions of large game. As you can see, the amount of food that men are keeping is significantly greater than what they're giving to or is being received by other households in camp. On average, during the period of my observation, the producer's household was keeping 42% of the large game carcass weight, while other households in camp were keeping an average of 9% of the carcass weight. So it, it does appear that there is a significant producer's advantage um, in, in my data set. And I also investigated whether or not we would find a demographic effect. I looked at whether the amount of food that the producer was able to keep varied depending on how large the camp was. So I've investigated whether the size of a camp measured either in terms of the number of people who are resident or the number of households who are resident would affect the amount that they were keeping, predicting, of course, that they would be keeping less in larger camps. And controlling for carcass size, I did not find an effect like this of of a demography. So what I interpret these data as indicating is that there is a large uh, producer's advantage and that uh, men were able to exert some control over distributions of large carcasses across different camps. Another thing I investigated was not just the overall weight of shares that were being kept by producers, but also the quality of the different shares that producers retained in comparison to what others received. So I identified two elements of large game carcasses which have especially uh, valuable utility. So these which I've used for this sake are the skins of kudu and the skins of impala, which the Hadza regard very highly. And they use, you can see this, this image here is a sleeping mat inside of a person's hut. 
People use the skins of kudu and they use the skins of impala as sleeping surfaces. They also use them as working surfaces and they use the leather and tool manufacture. So the skin is a particularly valuable part of a large uh, game carcass. So I investigated the likelihood of a producer retaining these in comparison to other households in camp and you find a very strong effect in which producers are much more likely to be keeping the skins than other households in camp. I also looked at different carcass elements and the distribution of these among households and camps. So ethnoarchaeologists have done a lot of research in which they've identified the different food utility values of carcass elements, which is typically the overall weight of the piece minus the inedible fraction, you know, bone, typically. It's, it's usually meat and marrow minus bone. <coughs> and so a given unit of a high utility um, carcass element has more of a food value the highest element usually found when in these analyses that have been done of uh, large ungulates is that the femur has the highest corresponding food utility value because it has a large store of marrow within, within it and it also has a huge amount because of meat due to the heavy hamstrings and quadriceps of, of, of these animals. So if you're going to get any piece of, a, of an animal, um, the, the hind limbs are especially good ones to get. So I, I investigated this and I found again that there was a much higher likelihood of producers keeping these particular elements than other households in camp. So this is further evidence that men are exerting some level of control over distributions to the benefit of their households. This is an overview of all of the foods in terms of the primary distribution of all the foods that I've looked at. And again, we find that across all the different resource classes, there is an advantage going to the producer's household. So in white, we have the size of the share kept by the producer and in the, the, the diagonal hatched box plots are either the average share given, meaning of the, share, of the households that received anything, what was the average amount they kept. And then if you include those households in camp that received nothing, because that's quite often the case, then of course that lowers the average and that's what the second uh, hatched mark box plot indicates. And if you simply take the amount of weight of these uh, food classes that are being kept by the producer as a numerator and you divide it by what is being received by other households, on average you find in the case of fruit that they're keeping 43 times more than what other household members are getting on average. In the case of honey, it's 14 times more. Large game, 8 times more. Small game, 11 times more. So there's a producer's advantage uh, in all these resource classes. Of course, it varies by resource class, but it's present in all of them. Now if we move on to complete distributions, these are those instances in which I was able to observe all of the food consumption that occurred. As a quick overview, first what I've done is I've, calc I've, I've calculated the total amount that's usually eaten of these foods by members of the producer's household and I've compared it to what is eaten on average by other households in camp. And you find there's a a strong statistical difference with producers' households eating a, medium, a median of 42% of a given package, while other households in camp are receiving and eating about 7% of the food package. And this covers all the complete distributions in my data set, small game, honey, uh, fruit, and that tuber. Now to get at the issue of food sharing between husbands and wives, what I've done is I've looked at the foods that men are bringing back, the amount that women who are in camp of reproductive age, which I just say ranges between 18 and 50 for this sake, who are unrelated to the producer. So these are individuals who are more distantly related than a second cousin. Um, of those women in camp, what is the average portion of men's foods that they eat compared to the amount that is eaten by the food producer himself? And then I compare that to the per capita values of their wives. So you can see um, that there, there's quite an advantage in terms of the relative consumption of wives compared to other women in camp. Wives are eating a median of 11% of the foods that men are producing, whereas other women in camp have a very low median value of actually zero. Um, this data, I think, is quite illustrative of a, a very common uh, pattern that I observed in my food sharing data which is that when men are coming into camp with foods, tip of, of definitely in the case of everything but the largest game, the food that's brought in is intended for others. We haven't analyzed our foray data yet, 
um, in which we can then tabulate how much food men are eating outside of camp compared to what they're eating inside of camp. But in general, after having gone on many of these trips myself, I can say that what men are typically doing is they're feeding themselves when they're out foraging. They come back to camp with foods, and typically what they'll do is, they'll, if their wife is present, is hand it completely to them and give it away. And so it's not surprising to me that the median value of what men are eating themselves is zero in my data set um, because of this, of this pattern of sharing. Now what I'm doing is I'm comparing the per capita consumption of children of the producer and comparing that to other children in camp who are resident and could have potentially eaten foods. And again, you see a very strong advantage in which producers' children on average are eating about 14% of what men were producing in this camp, whereas other children ate a median of 1%. Another analysis that I've done looks at biases in sharing that have to do with kinship. So for this analysis, I did a very simple way of quantifying um, sharing and consumption. What I did was I calculated for every food distribution, um, for these 52 complete food distributions in which a, uh, a, uh, a producer was uh, married, I looked at the whether or not an individual ate or did not eat. This has no tabulation of how much or relative values, it's just a yes or no binary variable. Did they eat or did they not? And everyone in camp at the time of this food distribution can be categorized into three categories. They can be categorized as husband's kin, they can be categorized as wife's kin, affinal kin, or non-kin. And I'd, I make the cutoff between kin and non-kin at the same second cousins uh, or closer being kin. Those more distantly related as non-kin. And I just calculate the probability of each one of these categories of individuals of yes eating or no not eating. That's how this an analysis generates these probabilities which show that if you are, according to my category, one of uh, the husband's kin, you have a 46% chance of eating when they arrive in camp with, this, with, with any type of food. Whereas if you're uh, wives kin, you have a 17% chance, and if you're a non kin, you have a 10% chance. So both wives kin and husbands kin have a greater likelihood of eating than uh, non kin. And this just demonstrates a general pattern that we've found in other analyses that we've done. We found that childcare as well has this kin bias. So while the Hadza live, they live in camps that include a lot of close kin, and yet even within those camps, they're also strategically. Um, allocating help and food. That's what this data seem to indicate. So what I've done is I've shown that there are some prefer preferential sharing behaviors going on um, between producers and their kin, their spouses and their children. Um, but what I haven't really paid much attention to and which deserves a lot of attention is the relationship between hunting and uh, men's larger role in the community and the way that they define their status and generate respect and collaboration and cooperation with their peers. This has received a lot of attention um, in prior work with the Hadza and I completely agree um, that hunting is a very large part of what men are doing to establish themselves in a community um, and, and that the producer's advantage that I've demonstrated doesn't take away from that fact. Um, there is a huge amount of food. I mean, the, the amount of and in terms of large game, the amount that men are giving away is, uh, I don't think there's any economy in the world that has that high of a tax rate. You know, it's, it, even Scandinavia doesn't, doesn't uh, have that high of a tax rate. So they're giving away a huge amount of the meat that they're producing. And, and I, I think that this, that this sharing and this giving to others definitely is a way for men to establish their reputations and enforce and demonstrate cooperative bonds between individuals. And the only point that I would make is that you can, you can have the showing off and you can have uh, the benefits for your household. I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. Um, but just as a demonstration of how important these, um, these aspects of hunting are, it's worth noting that you know, men in particular are expected to kill a large animal sometime um, in their early 20s or before in order to enter this group of men who are initiated and who are allowed to then eat sacred uh, elements and portions of, of these large game carcasses. So there's a, 
there's actually an initiation process which I've been able to observe twice, um, which this individual here has just underwent, which I think demonstrates some of the ethos that are embodied in these, in these rituals. So this individual had uh, killed a, a warthog, which is one of these animals that have a special meaning to the Hadza. And after doing so, he went through this process of initiation. And in this ritual, he's taken outside of camp, gathered around with the other men, and he's ritually killed. So there's a, there's a, you know, he described it to me as if he gets knocked over the head and knocked out and he's dead. And he gets dragged back into the camp, put in his house, covered in the fat of the animal. And then all the women in the camp take off all the, all the beads and all the adornment that they're wearing and he gets covered in beads. You can see that's, that's the state he's in right now. He's covered in, uh, and draped in these beads and just in keeping with this, with this idea of being killed and reborn, these men are then for the next month not allowed to leave camp and not allowed to handle bows or axes or any kind of implements that would allow them to go and forage for themselves. So this, 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 this ritual reinforces this idea that he's been killed and reborn and like a child he's dependent upon others to be fed. He can't leave camp for a month so all the food he receives is from others. So while he might enter this, uh, this initiation by having killed a large animal, what the ritual seems to indicate is that you are always dependent upon others and the generosity of others um, to, be, to, to be able to survive in the society. So, and, and in fact, in my, if I can just go back for a moment here, in my large game uh, sharing sample, you can see this one outlier here and I think it's a very illustrative outlier, in fact, of the sharing of large game in which the producer himself kept zero of the, uh, the total carcass. This was a case in which a, a young man who had not yet been initiated into this group of elder men had killed an impala and he brought it back to camp and gave it to a friend of his who was actually the individual who I showed wearing the, wearing the giraffe on his head. He gave it to this individual and allowed him to distribute it among the camp. And he said, I'm giving it to, to my Mze, which means, you know, an older, respected man. So he gave it to him and he went and distributed it with everyone. And in the next day, um, I can't claim to know exactly what happened, but all I know is that a, a hush went over the camp that I was living in and a voice started calling out from outside the camp and they were calling out the name of the, the man who had just killed that impala and distributed it among the camp. And he had received a, a type of ritual recognition for, for doing the sharing. So I absolutely agree that uh, hunting is central to, to men's establishing their role in the community and their status. Um, and, I don't, I don't, and I don't mean to be understood otherwise. So taking all of our uh, data together and returning to the question of the relationship between men's food production and their reproductive success, I think our data indicate at least three plausible intermediate mechanisms that can plausibly create this relationship. So I think the fact that successful food producers seem to assortively pair with successful female foragers I think is a very real thing. It's not something I've focused on with my data yet, but I think it's, it's, it's very much um, a real phenomenon. Secondly, I do think that men's uh, provisioning will have an effect on the quality and condition of their offspring. I think that showing, we've shown that there is a uh, bias in these food distributions such that children benefit. And I also think that successful male food producers will also be uh, able to share more food directly with their wives and that such sharing might also improve their condition as has been shown by the work of Hawks and colleagues. So I think that these are uh, valid potential mechanisms for the, generating this uh, relationship. However, you know, there are many other possible ways that men's food production can be related to their fitness and one that we haven't really discussed and I haven't really discussed here is just how critical sharing is with other members of camp and um, in particular other kin. I've touched on it but I think that if we're going to understand, you know, how people successfully make a living in this, in this world, you know, we, we really do have to pay more attention to um, 
the relationships of individuals to their extended kin, not just the nuclear family. So just as an illustration of the importance of the extended family, this is a, a tabulation of the other kin who I've observed in 15 camps co-residing with children. So here in Ego, um, these are 125 children under the age of 10. And in these 15 camps, I've written these numbers next to each uh, kin category showing the probability that they will co-reside with these individuals. So what you can see is that there is a bias in which uh, children are more often uh, found in, in um, proximity to their mother's kin. Um, this Uxora local trend has been identified, of course, in the work that, that uh, Nicholas has done with the Hadza, and it's been found in, in any census done with the Hadza. So I think uh, people's uh, matrilineal kin and are especially important um, in you know, raising children successfully. And I've just embarked on a two-year project in which I'll be analyzing some of the processes that affect the variation within this pattern. So there is a huge amount of variation in who individuals are living with. And one of the predictions that we make is that um, more successful food producers will be more often co-residing with larger kin networks. And I think this is another um, potential you know, intermediate process in which successful food production is going to be linked to uh, the um, outcomes of, of, of growth and reproduction. So in the future work that we'll be doing, we'll be focusing more as well upon analyzing the data that we've collected, which shows how wives are sharing foods. So we have a huge data set which will allow us to look at the other half of the nuclear family arrangement to see how much food wives are giving to husbands and as I mentioned before, exploring these relationships between food production and co-residence and cooperation with kin. And uh, with that, I think I'm done. Just like to finish and give a big thank you to Brooke for inviting me out here to talk um, and to the organizers of the Beck series. Of course, it goes without saying, the Hadza are the most important part of all of this work. And, uh, and I'd just like to Thank these individuals, especially uh, Nicholas, for making an appearance and uh, and keeping us cool during my <laughs> presentation. And if anyone has any questions, I'd I'd be happy to happy to take them. Thank you. <laughs>